And it's just, it is beautiful. It's, it's wonderful. I, I hope that if you're able to, you know, no pressure. But if you're able to, if you're healthy, uh, we welcome you to sign up and join us in person. Um, today, I believe we have Elaine is one of our local missionaries, if she is available. Hi, OCCEC yes, family. Um, my name is Elaine Chen. Uh, I am currently on staff with the Navigators at UC Davis. And uh, yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you guys so much for uh, the continual support um, for me and the ministry up here. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to update you guys a little bit about what the Lord is doing up here in Davis. Um, so everything currently for our ministry has moved on to Zoom um, or just other social media platforms. And uh, what I think has been cool and encouraging is that a lot of the students who have gone home, a lot of the students who um, now just aren't in the area are still wanting to be plugged in and still wanting to uh, grow um, and uh, know Jesus better. And so, yeah, we've had, um, this summer we've had weekly Bible studies, we've had book clubs, we've had, um, yeah, just different Bible studies that have been happening. Um, so yeah, that has been really, really encouraging for us, um, during this season where it kind of just seems chaotic and, um, everyone's, uh, just unmotivated. Um, it's been really encouraging to see students still wanting to be plugged into our ministry. Um, yeah, and I, I think like a prayer request that I would love for you guys to pray for the ministry at Davis is that um, we UC Davis still hasn't had an official statement of what the fall is going to look like. Um, and so as me and the staff team are planning for the fall, we would just love for you guys to pray for just the Lord's wisdom on um, what next step looks like, how we can best reach out to freshmen, how we can best reach out to um the the inco or the returning students um but yeah i i just want to th say thank you so much um for all your guys' support okay welcome back living up to what we have been given all of us who believe in jesus christ has been given the precious gift of life it is a life that was once uh dead in sin and leading to death but now by the grace and mercy of god is been restored, it's been brought up from the grave, it's been renewed. A life that was once full of darkness is now full of light. A life that was once on the path to, to doom and destruction is now on the path to glory and the kingdom of God. It is a beautiful life and it is a beautiful gift that we have been given because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so often the scriptures call us to, to live in, to walk in, to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the calling that we have received. In other words, live up to what you have been given. Live up to the life that we've been given. Today, we're going to be looking at a passage, um, Joshua chapter 15, 16, and 17, three chapters. However, we're going to be jumping around and, and skipping some of the cities and the, some of the allotments. And we're going to be looking at three tribes, Judah, Manasseh, and the half-tribe of Ephraim. I mean, Judah, Ephraim, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. We're going to be looking at their allotment. And some of the tribes, uh, some of the people live up to the calling that they receive, and some don't. And in that midst of living up and not living up to it, we're going to learn some biblical principles about living up to the calling that we have been given, living up to what we have been given. So at this time, uh, I would like to invite up Chris to read for us the passages. Uh, yes, please come up, Chris. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Today's passage, today's passage comes from Joshua chapters 15 through 17, select verses. Here we go. So first in Joshua 15, 1, the allotment for the tribe of the people of Judah, according to their clans, reach southward to the boundary of Edom, to the Wilderness of Zin at the farthest south. To verse 13 to 19, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephna, a portion among the people of Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, 
And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, who are Sheshai, Amen, and Tommy, the descendants of Anak. And when he went up from there against the inhabitants of Deber. Now the name of Deber formerly was Kiroth Sefer. And Caleb said, whoever strikes Kiroth Sefer, and then gets cut off. We go over to verse 63. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. The allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country of Bethel. Then going from Bethel to Luz, it passes along to Atheroth, the territory of the Arctites. Then it goes down westward to the territory of the Jephthalites, as far as the territory of Lower Bethoron, then to Gezer, and it ends at the sea. Verse 10. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. Chapter 17. Then allotment was made for the people of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. Now Zelophehad, the son of Hepher, son of Gilad, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters. Mala, Noah, Hogla, Malka, and Terzah. They approached Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun. And the leaders said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. Then to verse 12. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not utterly drive them out. This is the holy and inerrant word of the Lord. Okay, hello. Uh, we, we had some technical difficulties, um, but we got people on it. Hopefully you can hear me now. I apologize for any inconvenience and disruptions. We are definitely flawed, but our God is not flawed. And it's amazing that our flaws are not a hindrance to the work of God in the lives of his people. And so we praise God even more. Um, one thing that I was sharing before uh, we realized I was muted, was that uh, the passages that we all read, it, it jumped from place to place, and it was a bit confusing. Um, one of the main things that we wanted to read was that each of the tribes, Judah, Ephraim, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they received an allotment. And one of the things that we also wanted to read was that each of the tribes, the tribe of Judah, was not able to take the, um, to drive out the people in the land. The tribe of Ephraim was not able to drive out the people from the land. And the tribe of Manasseh was not able to drive out the people from the land. They weren't able to take full possession of their inheritance. And in the midst of their inability, 
there's an example of Caleb who was able to drive out the inhabitants and take possession. And there were the five daughters who were able to stand up courageously and take possession of their inheritance. And so that's the big overview of the picture. And today, living up to what we have been given. Have you ever been given an opportunity so good that you couldn't pass it up? One of those chances in life where it's, you got to grab it when you see it. About 15 years ago, I ran into a buddy of mine in a parking lot. And he was driving a souped-up car at the time. And, uh, I mean, the car came really fast stock, but he was telling me how he fixed it up, how he dumped all this money into it, things that he did to it, making it even faster. He was telling me the horsepower and how fast it goes. And, and I just blurted out, hey, let me take it for a spin. You know, and I, and I smiled. He smiled at me. And he kind of paused. And so, I, you know, I made it sweeter. I said, I promise, I'll bring it back. And so he, he said, okay. He reached in his pocket. He handed me the keys. But before I could grab them, he asked me a question. He said, do you know how to drive stick? How hard could it be, right? I, I didn't know, but I said, how hard could it be? And, and so he's like, uh, okay, fine. He gives me the keys. I get in the car. I turn it on. Boom. It's Engine's rumbling. I'm about to go speed racer on it. I take the emergency brake off. I put it into reverse, and the car stalls. So I turn it on again, put it into reverse. The car stalls again. I did this four times. After the fourth time, I put the emergency brake on, I got out of the car, I handed the keys to my friend, and I just walked away quietly. I did not say anything, I did not call him. You know, we, we hooked up again later on, but yeah. I had been given an opportunity so good, but I could not live up to it. I was given a chance of a lifetime to draw, drive a very souped up fast Asian rice rocket but I could not live up to it. The three, the two and a half tribes in our passage today were giving something more precious than Willy Wonka's golden ticket. They were living in a time that was much harder than what Charlie was living in. You got to remember, the Israelites, about 50 years ago, they were slaves in Egypt. They were living as slaves. About 40-something years ago, before, they're wandering the desert. However, by the grace of God and by the power of God, they crossed into the Canaan land. And they destroyed the Middle Kingdoms. They destroyed the kings in the south. They conquered the kings in the north by the grace and mercy of God. God gave them victory after victory, and they destroyed the kings of the land. And now they were divvying up the land, and all the people had to do was go in and drive out the inhabitants that remained. Your kings are defeated. You need to leave. However, as the passage tells us, in chapter 15, Judah, but the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. The people of Ephraim, did not drive out the Canaanites and only made them to do forced labor. And the half-tribe of Manasseh could not drive out the Canaanites. But when they grew strong, they forced them to do forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. In other words, they were given this precious land, this precious opportunity, this golden ticket, but they didn't live up to it. They weren't able to drive out the people in the land. And so today, very simple. The ABCs, and, and possibly D too. I'm not too sure on the time, but if we got enough time, there, there's a fourth one, okay? It might be a bonus one. But the ABCs of living up to what we've been given, okay? So A, A is for attitude. A is for attitude. In the tribe of Judah, in the first portion, in chapter 15 of our passage today, 
we're shown this example of Caleb. Caleb was given the land of Hebron. Now, you got to understand, Hebron was a fortress. Hebron was the city on the hill. It had huge walls and fortification. Hebron was the city of the giants. Hebron, if you remember back before uh, when Moses was still around, when they sent in the 12 spies, the spies that went in, they went into the land of Hebron. And they looked and they saw the giants. They saw the huge walls. Hebron was the place that made 10 of the tribal leaders shake in fear. Hebron was the place where they, they were, was the, un, the place that they weren't able to overcome. Hebron was a land full of giants who, who made them scared, who destroyed their attitude, who met, made them water and, and fall apart. That was Hebron. Yet, Caleb looks at Hebron and he has a different attitude. Back in Numbers 13, when Caleb first uh, spied out the land, he said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. You see, Caleb had an attitude, a different attitude from the rest of the people. He had an attitude of ability, an attitude of we can do it. He had a positive attitude, we could say. However, it's just not positive thinking. If we look back into Joshua 14, uh, I think Pastor Ted touched on this really briefly last week. But in Joshua chapter 14, it says, when Caleb goes up to Joshua, he says, So now give me this hell country for which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim, you know, those are the giants, were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said. It may be. Do you see the attitude of Caleb? It's just not we can go and take it because we're strong, or I'm able to, or I'm courageous, or I have more people on my side, but no. He says, it may be. There is an attitude of hope in Caleb that God would do it. There's an attitude of, of, of trust in God. His attitude was founded not upon his skills, his abilities, his talents, but upon God. Caleb had an attitude of hope in God. You know, and in Joshua chapter 15, it says Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak. He had an attitude of hope. He had an attitude that hoped in God. When he was faced with the giants, when he was faced with this fortress, when he was faced with this overwhelming obstacle, he did not falter. He did not complain. He did not bicker. Rather, hope arose in his heart. You know, there's this blessed example of King David and a guy named Shimei. Back in Second. I say back in 2 Samuel 16 because we're, it's back in history. However, from our passage, it's actually forward in history. And so looking forward to the time of the kings, when King David ruled, there was a time when his son Absalom took the throne from him, and David had to go on the run. And as David was leaving Jerusalem, going into exile, he had his mighty men on his left and right, soldiers, warriors. And there's this guy named Shimei who sat on top of a hill and he was throwing rocks and kicking dirt at the king and his people. And at that time, one of the warriors next to David said, Hey, why is this guy throwing rocks at you? You know, let, let me go over there and cut his head off. Now, whew, now warriors... And David says this in 2 Samuel 16, 11 and 12. David said to Abishai, who was one of the uh, mighty men of David, and to all his servants, Behold, my son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse? For the Lord has told him to do it. For the Lord has told him to. 
it may be. David says, it may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me. And that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. Imagine King David being chased out of Jerusalem, with, surrounded by his warriors. And there's this guy kicking dirt and throwing rocks at him. What would you have done? Yeah, go get him. Go chop his head off. How dare he disrespect me like that? But King David was different. He had a different aroma that arose out of his heart that day. He had a different attitude. He had a different heart. He had a heart that hoped in God. It may be, he says, that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and repay me for good. Friends, when we're in the struggle of life, when we've been wronged or when things are coming at us, when the trials and tribulations of life seem to arise and we're being persecuted. It's easy to strike back. We want to strike back. But there could be a different attitude that arises in our hearts, like King David, like Caleb, an attitude of hope in God. Who knows? Maybe God will use this to bring about good. Maybe God will use this to bring about a change. There was a hope and an attitude that we saw in Caleb, and he was able to overcome the giants. Second, B. B stands for box. The box. The box of unbelief. And Joshua 16 says, when speaking about the tribe of Ephraim, it says this. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. Did not drive. Okay, Judah could not. Manasseh could not. But later, when they were grew strong, they did not. What's the difference? The difference between could not and did not is a choice. It's a decision. Did not implies that you could have. Did not implies that, you know what, you could do it, but you chose not to. And within the context, we're given a clue. The Canaanites lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. God told them to drive out the people from the land. God told them to not make any uh, relations with the people. However, why drive them out? Why get rid of this free labor? In other words, they had an unbelief. They believed something different than what God told them. God told them to drive out the people from the land, and they saw free labor. There was a box of unbelief. You know, friends, just because we believe in Jesus doesn't mean that there's not any unbelief in our hearts. You know, we all grew up in a culture, in a time, in a generation, under circumstances and situations that have formed us and shaped us very differently. And sometimes, yes, we believe in Jesus. We believe that he saved us. We believe he is our Savior. But sometimes as we read the scriptures... We might find things that are hard to believe, some things that we might not want to believe, some things that in life has trained us to believe differently about the situation. You know, King Saul, King Saul was the first king of Israel. I mean, he gets a lot of, um, he gets a lot of flack because, you know, he tried to kill King David like the beloved child, the beloved king and all that. But you got to understand, King Saul was the first king who united the 12 tribes of Israel. He was the first king. Yet, in 1 Samuel 15, God calls him to go and destroy the Amalekites. 
The Amalekites were people who attacked the, the people of God when they were, were coming out of Egypt and were wandering in the wilderness towards the land, the promised land. And so God calls King Saul to go and attack the Amalekites. He says, utterly destroy them. Destroy everything for them that they have. And so King Saul goes and he attacks them and he, and he destroys them. He's victorious. However, he saves the best sheep. He saves the best animals. He saves all the good things in the land. He saves the king and puts the rest to destruction. And then the prophet Samuel comes to him and says, why did you not obey the word of the Lord? Why did you not believe what he said? I mean, the second part is what I added. You know, why didn't you do what God said? Why didn't you listen to the voice of the Lord? And Saul says, I did. I went, I destroyed the Malachites, we're victorious. And Samuel says, what's this sheep noise that I hear? What's this cattle noise that I hear? There is a belief in Christianity. I believe in Jesus. But, you know, I believe the big things, but all these small things don't really matter. You know, we believe in Jesus as the Lord and Savior, but these small little things, you know, do I really need to believe this or this or that? And this one incident of unbelief is what lost Saul King, the kingdom. In other words, this one disbelief in God's word is what boxed him in from continuing as king and moving forward in life. This unbelief that he had in the word of God enclosed him. Friends, sometimes we might read something in scripture that's hard to believe, what we don't want to believe, where culture says the very opposite. And we think it might be a small little thing, but this unbelief will box us in and will keep us from moving forward in our relationship with God. You know, there's this uh, person, D.L. Moody, very old person. I mean, he's not living anymore, but D.L. Moody. When he was a young teenager, he, he went to a, a revival night. And, you know, he was very touched by the speaker. And then across the street from the church was a park. And he was sitting on the park bench. And he was thinking about the message that he heard. And he was, you know, he was contemplating the depth of it and wondering about it. And just, just you know, recalling what was spoken. And the speaker came. And he sat down next to him on that bench. And the speaker said to him, the world has yet to see what God can do with the man fully consecrated to him. The world has yet to see what God can do with the man fully consecrated to him. To a man who fully believed in him, to a man fully trusted in God, to a person who fully believed in God, the world has yet to see what God could do. And that's when D.L. Moody said, by God's help, I will be that man. D.L. Moody, he had a fifth grade education. He was one of the greatest evangelists of his time. Spoke to thousands of people, you know, tens and twenty thousands of people at a time. He has a college. He started a university, a Bible college. The D.L. Moody Institute, or the Moody Institute. This was, it, it was said of him that when he came to a town and spoke, the sale of alcohol would drop. That's how big of an impact this man had. Because he believed in God. He had a simple faith that I will believe, that the box of unbelief would not become his hindrance. This is a beautiful picture, ain't it? Thomas Aquinas was a medieval, medieval uh, theologian, one of the, the brightest minds in Christianity during that time. In seminary, they called him the ox. 
because he was kind of large, but he, was, uh, he didn't speak a lot. And so people assumed that he was slow. However, he was very virulent. He just didn't talk a lot in class. And his classmates would always make fun of him and joke about him, calling him an ox and a slow person. And then one day, they looked out the window and said, Thomas, look, there's a pig that can fly. Thomas got up, ran over there, and looked out the window. And they're like, ah, oh, like, how could you be so, so naive, Thomas? How could you be so uh, gullible? Thomas looked, and he said, I would rather believe that pigs can fly than believe that my brethren could lie. He had a childlike faith that believed. Friends, this is the kind of childlike faith we need when we approach Scripture, when we approach the truth of God. God does not lie and cannot lie, and he will not. Belief. There is a box of unbelief that if we take part in it, will trap us and keep us from moving forward in Christ. First, there's the attitude of hope. But secondly, there's breaking the box of unbelief. Oh, uh, if you're following along in our uh, outline, first one, uh, attitude of hope. Second line, breaking the box of unbelief. Third, C, courage to stand. Courage to stand. One of the blessings that we see today in our passage is that there were three daughters, five daughters, um, five daughters of Zelophad. And when they were distributing the land, when the allotment came up, they stood. They stood before the priests. They stood before Joshua. And they said, give us the portion that Moses promised us. Courage to stand. And we look at them and we think, man, I want to be courageous. I want to stand for God. I, I, want, I want to be a courageous person. But how? Where did their courage come from? How are they courageous enough to stand? You know, one of my favorite Bible stories is Daniel in the lion's den. Um, if you don't know the story, Daniel takes place a long time ago when um, some other government leaders decided to say, hey, king, you know, um, if anybody prays to anyone else other than you, let, let's throw them in a lion's den, you know. And, and so the king's like, oh, that's a great idea. You know, I, I want everyone to praise me. So he signs that into law. And Daniel hears about this law being passed that if anyone prays to anybody else other than the king, that he's going to get thrown in a lion's den. And so he's faced. He's faced with a dilemma. Do I pray or do I not pray? So Daniel prays. And the people hear about it. The king hears about it. So he takes them and he throws them in a lion's den. And typically when we hear this story, we think, you know, we got to be courageous like Daniel. We got to stand up for the truth of God. We got to stand for the Bible. We got to stand for God's truth. We have to stand for God. We have to be courageous. But how? How can we be courageous? Oh, don't count your life worthy. You know, God has to be the highest priority. How? How was Daniel able to stand up to the edict of the king as he knew that if he did pray, that it would lead to death? You know, in Daniel chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, uh, I'm just going to read the last part This about this. It says, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chambers, open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously previously. In other words, this is a habit, something he had been doing his whole life. 
He didn't just hear about this edict that said, oh, you can't worship God and, and decided to stand courageously in defiance of it. No. It's a habit that he had prepared, something he had been doing previously. You know, I don't know if you've seen this uh, video. This is a, actually an old one. The new school one has it where the dominoes are a lot bigger and there's a car at the end of it that gets crushed. But, but this picture, if you look at it, do you see that little tiny like square piece of paper domino? That's actually a little tiny one that he's putting down with tweezers. It's really small, but he pushes that one, and then it pushes the next one and the next one and the next one. And eventually, that little tiny piece of paper causes enough to push down the big one at the end. You know, I, I don't know the physical terms for it. I, I'm sure some of our students could type in the laws, the physical laws or the the mechanical laws that apply to it. But what I do know is that when we start small, we can do more and more and more. It's the example of Daniel. You know, he didn't just stand up to the king one day, but he started, he started, he did, he did, he did, and eventually he even had enough courage to stand. Friends, it's not about doing everything that we can. It's not about always having to stand up for everything, but standing up for even the small things in our days. Maybe even just standing up and waking up and reading the Bible in the morning for five minutes. That's a small thing that we can do. Standing up for the things that God has placed in us and given us the opportunity to do. Yeah, we got time. We got plenty of time. So there's an attitude of hope. There's a breaking the box of unbelief. There's courage to stand. D. Do. Okay, yeah, I'm scraping the bottom, bottom of the braille with this one. Okay, but do. Do all that you can with what God has given you. You know, at the end of chapter 17, there's this passage where the people of... Um, or Manasseh, or the people of Joseph, they come to him. And they say, look, we're a numerous people. The land is too narrow for us. And then Joshua says to them, hey, if, if the land is too narrow, cut down the forest, and you can have its furthest reaches. In other words, they came to him wanting something else when they didn't take possession of what they were already given. Friends, the last one is do. Do all that you can with what you have been given. You know, have you seen the movie, uh, The Ultimate Gift? Anyone? Okay, I'm going to ruin it for you guys because it came out in like the 80s, maybe the 90s. And, and so there's a very small chance you'll ever see it. But The Ultimate Gift, it's a story uh, about this, this uh, person who strikes it rich in the oil industry in Texas. Um, Multi-billion, trillion, gazillionaire. However, as he lives life, he has three sons and a daughter, and he realizes that the money destroyed them. This vast wealth that they had been given just destroyed their lives, destroyed their relationships, destroyed who they were as people. And as the father is on his deathbed, about to pass away, he gives one gift to a, one of his uh, nephews. And um, he gives them a gift where, actually he gives them seven gifts. Uh, but the first gift that he gives them is the gift of, you know, making friends. He gives them these tasks that, um, there are small gifts that change him and cause him to grow. For example, the first gift was they took away all his money so he had to make real friends to help him out. The second gift was that he had to go and he had to work, do a day's work with a person to actually learn what making money was about. And so all through these different gifts, he's developing him, he's growing him, and causing him to grow more and more. 
And when he completes all these last gifts, as the father or the grandfather is passing away, he writes the son or his nephew a check for $100 million. And instead of blowing it on, on material possessions or anything else, because he's received all these other gifts that grew him and changed him, he goes and he builds a hospital to help people. You know, he does good with this money. He does this good thing. And then, here's the twist. Afterwards, at the end, when he realizes, when the lawyers that gave him the check for the 100 million, when they realize that he did something good with it, how it benefited, how he lived up to what he was given, they give him the lion's share of the estate. You know, hundreds of billions of dollars. The moral of the movie was that he didn't, the, the grandfather didn't want to give them the money because he didn't want them, it to destroy them, to destroy their lives, to destroy their relationships. However, his nephew grew and grew and lived up to it, and so he received it. Friends, God has given us a precious life in Christ, bought with the blood of Jesus. But so often in life, we don't live up to what we've been given. And we need to grow. We need to grow in our attitude of hope. We need to grow in our belief of God. We need to grow in our courage to stand for the things of God. We need to grow in doing the things that God has given us to do so that we may live up to what he has given You know, worship in response. The message is just not something to listen to and then, okay, now it's lunchtime. But it's something to respond to. If you're able, please go to tinyurl.com forward slash OCCEC. And there's a few responses that we've uh, pre-made. First one, A. You know, check the box A if you want to pray for hope to arise within your heart. You might be going through a difficult situation or a difficult time. But instead of looking at the difficulties or the circumstances, check box A if you want to pray for God to work hope into your heart, knowing that God would overcome. Check box B if there is a confession and a repentance of an unbelief. Maybe God's been speaking to you about some truth or something to do, something to believe, but yet we've been hesitant. We've been unwilling. Check box B if you're willing to confess and repent of an unbelief. Check box C if you want to take a stand for faith. It could be small. Maybe take a stand for reading the Bible. Maybe take a stand for praying. Maybe take a stand in your family to be an influencer of grace and peace. Oh, that was actually box D. Uh, check box D if you want to be an active influencer of faith in, in your family. There's also, I believe, a box E where it says uh, a prayer request. If you have a special prayer request, something that you want us, me, or Ted to be praying for, or the, the prayer for people on Tuesdays, check that box and write it in. One of us will contact you. Let me pray. Lord, you give us grace each day to live up to what you have given us. We pray that we would overcome, not based upon our own skills or abilities, but by grace and faith in you, trusting in you, hoping in you, drawing closer to you. Let us live up to the precious life that you have given us. Let us stand up for the things that you've given us, for the opportunities you give us. I pray, Lord, that as Caleb lived up to what you had given him and as the five daughters lived up to what you have given them 
that we too may live up to what you have given us. That we would not be found lacking, but be found full in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.